Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. We are going to be talking about the very well-known and hot topic, the rapture. Okay, we're going to get a little bit of perspective, if you will. This, this, this topic is so big in regards to the rapture that we're not going to be able to go through everything today, not even close. But we're going to get a little bit of perspective, maybe even a complete perspective shift as to whether or not we can hasten the rapture. Can we hasten the coming of the Messiah? Many of you know my stance on this. Yes, 100% I believe that we can hasten the coming of the Messiah. We can hasten the rapture. But I want to give a little bit of perspective directly from the scripture with the rapture. I've done a teaching uh, I believe it was last Sukkot, so it may have been about October of last year, of 2021, uh, on the rapture, but now I'm going to give a little bit of a new perspective on this. It's a very, very big topic. In fact, this topic, many of you may know, because I've talked about it before, it is actually what brought me to Torah. It was through studying things with the rapture when I first came to the Lord and whenever I first got ordained in, at the end of 2018, in October of 2018, I began studying things about the rapture very, very deep for about seven months daily, hours upon hours upon hours a day. And it was actually through my studies of the end times and finding out the truth about the rapture, not adopting this theology and this opinion, this, that, and the other, but finding for myself as the Holy Spirit would show me what the scriptures have to say about this topic. It was through these studies that I actually came to a revelation of the Torah its impact on scripture, and how in order to understand the concept of the rapture, we have, to ve we have to study very deeply within the Torah. One of the scriptures I quote all the time, I quote it continually, is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, 9 and 10, the scripture tells us, there is nothing new under the sun, but that which has been will be, and whatever will be has already been. No, there is nothing new under the sun. And so, for example, if we want to study things that are found in the New Testament, well, nothing is new under the sun. And whatever will be has already been. And so if we want to go forward and know what the future holds, we have to go backwards and understand where we've come from. Everything is cyclical under the sun. And so this is a perspective that we have to have whenever we study end times. We have to understand the themes and patterns that are given to us within the Torah of Moses. And we have to take these lenses into our study of the New Testament and the things of the end times that the scripture has to tell us. Now, before I get into the teaching, I also want to encourage everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Nick Tognetti, as well as go and like and follow our two Facebook pages. Uh, Revelation Church Facebook page and my personal Facebook page. It is on all three of these platforms that we do our live broadcasts and that we share different teachings that we have. And I also want to encourage you to subscribe to our emailing list uh, through our website, revelation-church.org. And through this, you will be able, if you get on the, the emailing list and you're subscribed, we won't bombard you with a ton of emails, but we will send out different teachings. For example, I do a weekly blog every week, God willing, on Friday morning before Shabbat. I do a short blog on every Torah portion just to give us a digestible concept for us to take that is applicable to our daily life going forward, as well as a little bit of perspective that may be related to my teaching uh, that Shabbat. So it's just something to be able to get with you as well as being able to receive the emails for our Zoom meetings and for our Zoom studies. For example, every Saturday right now, we are doing, after the live broadcast at 12.15 p.m. Central Standard Time, we have an open Zoom meeting for anybody around the world to join. And it's a live Q&A. I am there personally. It's a live Q&A specifically on the teaching that I go over. So for example, today after my teaching, we will have a live Q&A at 12.15 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I send those Zoom links out through our emailing list. So please subscribe to the emailing list. And if you're new, please email us. We'd love to hear from you, get to know you, and be able to send that emailing, uh, be able to send that Zoom link out to you personally. Now, I want to get into the teaching for today. And as I said, we're going to be talking about can we hasten the rapture? This is one of the hottest topics in the faith. 
Okay, it's very debated over. And as I said, it's what actually brought me to a revelation of the Torah and into a more Jewish perspective of the scriptures and everything else that has transpired over the past three years. It was in 2019 that I came to these different revelations in regards to the end times, in regards to the Torah. Now, in Numbers chapter 13, we actually see that the Lord is sending 12 spies Right? This week's Torah portion is Numbers 13, 14, and 15. And God is sending 12 spies, a, tr uh, a spy that is a head of each tribe. Okay, He's a leader for each tribe. And so we have 12 spies going into the land of Israel. And we actually see in the scripture why he sends them and what their mission is to do. Okay, And so I want to start out here in Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The scripture says, And the Lord says to Moses, saying, Send for yourselves. That's very important. A lot of English translations will say, go and send. But it's important that it says, shalach lecha. Send for yourself. Okay? Send for yourself men, and they will search out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. <laughs> One man for each tribe of his fathers you shall send, a prince for each one. Okay, this is in Numbers 13, 1 and 2. So notice that the Lord is saying, send for yourselves a man from each tribe, a prince from each tribe, a leader, and they are going to search out the land. This is the reason for, for what they're doing. And the word for search out, vayaturu, is a very important word, which we'll get to hopefully here in a little bit. But I also want to skip down to verses 18 and 20, because the scriptures continue to tell us what their job is. And I'll see the land, and you shall see what it is. You shall see the people that dwell upon it. Are they strong or are they weak? Are they few or are they many? And what is the land which they dwell upon? Is it good or is it bad? And the cities which dwell in it, are they in camps or are they like fortresses? And is the land fat or is it lean? Is there trees in it or not? And you shall strengthen yourselves, and you shall take from the fruit of the land. For those days were the days of the first fruits of grapes. Okay? So, Moses is telling them after they're commanded to go and search out the land what they need to do. Hey, there's a couple things that we want you to find out for us. However, we find in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, it wasn't actually the Lord that gave this initial command. There was a reason why God is commanding Moses to do so. We have to read this in balance with the Numbers passage in order to understand. It says, Moses is speaking, and it says, See, the Lord your God has given before you the land. Ascend, possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers spoke to you. Do not fear, and do not be dismayed. You drew near to me, all of you, and you said, Let us send men before us, and they will so search the land for us, and they will return word to us about the way which we should ascend and the cities which we will come to. So notice Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, goes on to say, Moses says to the children of Israel, all of you approached me, and you're the ones that actually requested to search out the land. This was not initially God's influence or Moses' influence. This is the people of Israel. And they're saying the specific reason that we need to send people to search out the land, it gives two reasons in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. It says, so that we can see the way that we shall go up and the cities that we're about to come to. So what the scripture is saying is that God gave the vision and the promise. I'm giving you this land. But he did not tell them the way that they should go. All he said was, this is the promised land that I'm giving to you. But the children of Israel step up and they say, we need to see which way we're going to ascend. Basically what they were doing was not questioning the Lord in faithlessness. They're actually taking the word of the Lord 
and they're following it with wisdom. Now, a little bit later, obviously, when the 12 spies come back, the children of Israel are very dismayed. They're very fearful. They, ten of the spies bring back a false word. Meanwhile, Caleb and Joshua are saying good things about the land. So these are things that are afterwards. But initially, the children of Israel are taking something that is from the Lord, and they're wanting to learn how to apply it with wisdom. And notice what Moses says in verse 23. It says, And the matter was good in my eyes, and I took from you twelve men, a man for each tribe. So initially it was not the Lord that commanded the children of Israel to take a man for each tribe and go spy out the land. This was something that the people wanted, and Moses said it was good in my eyes, and therefore I did this. I chose a man for each tribe. We know that if it was good in Moses' eyes, it was good in the Lord's eyes because we see in Numbers 13, 1 and 2, that the Lord ends up commanding it and saying, yes, tell them to do this. And this is the way they're going to do it. They're going to take a man for each tribe. So we see that when the children of Israel decided to take the vision from the Lord, but find out how to go about it with wisdom, this pleased the Lord. It was not a lack of faith. And this was actually what he desired. He said, this is a good idea. Meaning the vision is from the Lord, but its execution is from us. Now here's the thing when it comes to the execution. Because God gives us wiggle room. He says, I'm going to let you learn how to execute this plan. But I'm telling you what the plan is, but I'm letting you go about it in a way that makes sense. Even though we have wiggle room, we have to understand the boundaries. The boundaries are found in the commandment to go and search out the land. It says, Vayaturu. It says, Lator. Lator. To search out, or to seek out, or to espy. Okay? The word Tor, Tav, Vav, Resh, is the same letters missing the, the, the end, hey, for the word Torah. Tor, search, is short for Torah. And so what it's saying is when we go search out the land and we try to find a way that we're to execute this plan that God gave us, it needs to be according to Torah. We cannot take something that's from the Lord and go about it in unrighteous means. You can't get to a righteous end through unrighteous means. It makes the whole thing unrighteous. We have to take what the Lord is giving us and we have to utilize the Torah that he has given us in order to go about this. So, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, The Torah is not in the heavens, that you should say who will bring it down for us. It is not over the seas that someone should say who should go and get it for us and bring it to us. It says, No, but the Torah is near to you in your mouth and in your heart. Meaning the Father has given us the tools necessary to go about getting his vision and making it real in the earth. And the same thing goes about for the rapture. He's given us the promise about the rapture, that there's going to be a trumpet that blows and the Messiah is going to send his angels and gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. We see this in Matthew 24. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 4. We see it multiple times throughout the New Testament. And by the way, we see it many times in the Torah. As I said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the scripture says nothing is new under the sun. So in order to understand these New Testament passages, we have to understand the context that was already given to us in the Torah. Okay, and so God is actually pleased with the fact that we take his vision and we say, let's figure out how to go about this with wisdom. God is basically giving a prophecy saying this is going to happen, but he's allowing us to make it happen. The execution is coming from us and we have to do so through the vessel of the Torah, through the vessel of the Messiah, who is the living Torah. In fact, in the book of Psalms, chapter 127, verses 1 and 2, it says, <clears throat> If the Lord does not build the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guards watch in vain. What is Psalm 127 one saying? It is not saying that we don't need to be builders or we don't need to be watchmen. What it's saying is that it needs to be from the Lord. But notice what the scripture emphasizes. There still has to be physical builders. There still has to be physical watchmen. We can't sit back and use the Lord's sovereignty and the Lord's power as a crutch for laziness 
a lack of repentance, and a lack of doing the work that he has called us to do. In fact, in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, chapter 118, verse 126, I'm sorry, 119, 126, it says, Eight la'asot la'adonai, hefei ru techa. It is time to work for the Lord. They have violated your Torah. Now, I won't say which version this is, but there is an English version out there that says, in that verse, it says, It is time for you, O Lord, to work. That is not what the scripture says. The scripture says, Eight la asot la Adonai. It is time to work for the Lord. It is our job to make these things come to pass. And so whenever we talk about sending spies to go into the land, in order for us to inherit the land. I've talked before on the land is actually a picture of the Messiah. Now, you can actually go either way, whether you say it's the first coming of the Messiah or the second coming of the Messiah. It's not an either or, it's an and and also. I could do a teaching for either one. In fact, I've done a teaching for both of them before. But the land is actually a picture of the Messiah. I'll give you an example. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, Yeshua is speaking to the lukewarm church, the lukewarm congregation. And he says, because you are naked and because you are neither hot nor cold, he goes, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. He's actually quoting Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20, which talks about nakedness of his people and says that if you do certain sins, the land is going to vomit you out of its mouth because of certain things in regards to nakedness. You can actually look at uh, Revelation chapter 3. Verse 16, really verses 14 through 22, and you can find it completely in Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20. What Yeshua literally substituted himself for the land, okay? Yeshua is the promised land. He is the promise, okay? The, the inheriting of the land is actually a picture of the second coming of the Messiah. And as I said, you can also show this for the first coming of the Messiah. But also in Deuteronomy 4 verse 22, it calls the land Ha'aretz Hatova Hazot. This good land. In Gematria, this good land, Ha'aretz HaTova HaZot, is 736, which is equivalent to Yeshua Shemi. Yeshua is my name. The land is a picture of Yeshua. It's a picture of the Messiah. So whenever we're talking about inheriting the land, we're actually talking about hastening the coming of the Messiah. Okay? And so I want to begin to look here in the New Testament. So in the New Testament... We see in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Now, in Acts chapter 1, Yeshua is with the disciples, and then he ascends into the heavens. And it says, whenever he ascends into the heavens, it says, starting in verse 10, it says, And while they were staring into heaven as he was departing, two men were found standing near him, clothed in white. And they said to them, Galilean men, why are you standing and staring into heaven? This Yeshua, who was taken up from you to heaven, likewise he will come, just as you have seen him who ascended into heaven. Notice what's happening. His disciples are sitting there looking up into heaven. And they just asked him, when will you return the kingdom to Israel? And they're staring, looking up into heaven, and two men clothed in white say, why are you staring into heaven? Didn't Yeshua just say that you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And then you're going to go out and do the work? Stop staring into heaven. Go and do the work. It is our job to execute the plan that has been given to us by the Lord. As I said, the rapture, the end time, the coming of the Messiah, we can actually hasten or delay the coming of the Messiah. If we talk about the rapture, for example, if we look at what the scriptures say about the rapture in the New Testament, okay, in Matthew 24, we see Yeshua discuss the rapture. It's an end time prophecy talking about right before his second coming and then including his second coming. And it says that there is going to be a trumpet that is blown. And when the trumpet is blown, he's going to send his angels that is going to gather the elect. They're going to gather the house of Israel from the four corners of the earth. So there is a trumpet blown and the Lord is going to descend and the people of God are going to be caught up and gathered to him. Now it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, Paul discusses the rapture and he says that there is going to be a shofar, a trumpet that is blown, and the Lord is going to descend, and we are going to ascend 
and meet him in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 gives us the same thing. As I said, though, in Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10, the scripture tells us that there is nothing new under the sun, but that which has been will be, and that which will be has already been. So in order to understand the future prophecy about the rapture, we have to understand things that have already taken place given to us in the Torah. Now, there's multiple things in the Torah that show us different angles of the rapture. I'll give you an example, and I'll go through about four examples, but I'm really only going to focus on two of them. For Sukkot, Sukkot, it is a picture of the end gathering, right? From wherever we are, we are going to be gathered to him. It's a picture of the rapture. The rapture. Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. There's going to be a trumpet blown and there's going to be a redemption. But the two that I want to focus on is the Jubilee and Shavuot. Shavuot is also known as Pentecost. The Jubilee in Leviticus 25 tells us, which by the way, the word Jubilee, Hayovel, is the word for a ram's horn. It's like a trumpet blast. In fact, Evan Ezra, a Jewish commentator, as well as Rashi, says that the Jubilee is literally called, the Jubilee year is literally called the year of the shofar blast. Okay, and what does the scripture say? It says that there, during the year of the shofar blast, the shofar is going to be blown, and it says that all of the people that have been scattered away from their possessions are now going to be redeemed back into their possession. It's a picture of the shofar being blown, and us who are in the Messiah are going to be gathered into our inheritance in the Messiah. Now think about Shavuot for a moment. We have the same thing with Shavuot. In, Shav- for, in, in Exodus chapter 19, it says for Shavuot that the Lord is wanting to come and meet with Israel in Exodus 19 and 20. But Exodus 19 gives us the prerequisites. It says that there is going to be a trumpet that is going to sound long, and the Lord is going to descend upon Mount Sinai, and the people of God are going to ascend and meet him. What did I say 1 Thessalonians 4 says? It says that there is going to be a trumpet that is blown. It says the Lord himself will descend and the people of God will ascend. Shavuot is actually a picture of the rapture. But it says before this takes place in Exodus 19, it says they must sanctify themselves and cleanse their garments. Only then will they be prepared for the third day when I will come to meet them, when the rapture will take place, when the trumpet will be blown, I will come down and they will come up. They must sanctify themselves and cleanse their garments. This is in Exodus 19. Now in Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, the scripture says, Behold, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready to be clothed with fine linen, white and clean, which is the righteousness of the saints. Notice the scripture says the bride has made herself ready. Just as Exodus 19 says she needs to prepare herself, she needs to cleanse her garments and sanctify herself. In order for the rapture to take place, it is dependent upon us. The first coming of the Messiah was not dependent upon us. The second coming of the Messiah and the final redemption and bringing him to this world here is dependent upon us. Our job is to make disciples. We see this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Yeshua says that all authority is given to him. And he is commanding us to go to all the nations and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that Yeshua taught them. The question is, what did Yeshua teach his disciples? He discipled them and the understandings of following in his footsteps in the ways of the Torah and how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what he said we're to do. We're to teach people these things. Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Imitate me. Paul says, Imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. And then we see in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, Verses 1 and 2 and 3, it says, Therefore, let us leave the basics of the word of the Messiah and continue on to its perfection. Or will you again lay another foundation for the repentance, for the repentance which is from, the, from dead works, and for the faith in God, and for the doctrine of immersion or baptism? 
and for the laying on of a hand, and for the resurrection from the dead, and for eternal judgment, we will do this if the Lord permits. So notice he says, let us move from the basics. Let us move from the basics of repentance and baptism and laying on of hands. Let's move forward into discipleship and knowing how to truly walk in the footsteps of the Messiah. And so as I said, the vision of inheriting the land, the vision of the rapture that is actually give us into, given to us in great detail in the scriptures is from the Lord himself. But the execution of this vision comes from us. It comes from our ability to be as the people of Israel as they were when they approached Moses and said, let us go and search out the land. La Torah. Meaning, let us go search according to the ways of the Torah. Let us dive deep into the Torah and let us follow in the footsteps of the Messiah and let's figure out how to bring Messiah. Let's figure out how to hasten his coming. I had a family one time tell me, they said, Nick, why should I care about hastening the coming of the Messiah? I'll see him when I see him. And I remember how much this troubled me. And I thought to myself, we're talking about the bride of the Messiah, talking about their groom in such a way. Let me ask you, do you think as a groom, Yeshua is okay with a bride saying, I don't really care when I see him. I'll see him when I see him. What kind of husband would want a bride that is like that? This is lukewarm. This is lukewarm. We need to be longing for our king. We need to be aching. What can we do to bring him here now? What, is, what can we do to be more watchful for him? Yeshua says, who is going to be watchful? Meanwhile, if I come back and I see you not doing the work, he gives parables for this in the, in the scriptures. If I come back and I see you not doing the work that I've called you to do, he goes, woe to you wicked servants. You did nothing to hasten my coming. It is our job to hasten the coming of the Messiah through our ability to be sanctified and cleanse our garments to have white garments, white and clean, fine linen garments, as Revelation 19, 7 through 9 says, so that we can be prepared and hasten the coming and the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what Revelation says. But here's the thing. Sanctification and the fulfilling of ministry will only come if we are filled with the Holy Spirit and moving in the power of the Spirit. John chapter 14, Yeshua tells his disciples. He says the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to teach you all things. He's going to bring all things to remembrance. He's going to give you understandings of the things that I taught you. And he's going to sanctify you. He's going to teach you to walk in the ways that I told you to walk in. He's going to break off sin from you. And he's going to teach you how to walk in holiness. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In order for us to fulfill our ministry, we have to be walking in the power of the Spirit. It says all throughout the scripture, the Gospels as well as the book of Acts, it says it with the disciples. In fact, it says it with Philip in Acts chapter 8. It says that the people of Samaria turn from Simon the sorcerer to Philip who is preaching Yeshua because of the signs that he did. Because of the power of the Spirit. Paul says the same thing. He goes, I did not come to you just with word, but with power. For the kingdom of God is not just word, but power. Elijah didn't just come with word. He showed and proved things with power. In order for us to be sanctified properly and for us to fulfill our ministry with power, we have to walk in the Holy Spirit. But I'm afraid today... I'm afraid today that that is few and far between and that the expectancy of these things are few and far between, if they're at all. I've heard many people in ministry, in ministry, pastors, elders, leaders, tell me that the Holy Spirit does not do the things today that he did back in the book of Acts, which is completely untrue. 
The scripture says that Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. The Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as I said, I'm afraid that it's become something that is theoretical. It's become theoretical, and it's something that is not truly experienced or tasted or realized in many, many, many believers' lives. I'll give you an example. There's a man that I know that I have great respect for. <clears throat> in fact, this man probably knows more about the scriptures than 98% of the believers that I know. He's very well learned and he's very well versed. And when it comes to quoting the scriptures and this, that, and the other, he can talk about the Holy Spirit, no problem. But I remember in 2019, I was talking with this man and I began talking to him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've been hearing me talk for weeks now about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And how just because you become a believer in Yeshua does not mean that one is baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. Acts chapter 2 shows this. Acts chapter 8 shows this. Acts chapter 19 shows this. And we can't pull scriptures out from Ephesians and other scriptures without studying the book of Acts first. We have to understand the context of the book of Acts in order to understand the other epistles. And I was telling this man, I said that he needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he did not really, he was not familiar with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what takes place, by the way, in Acts chapter 19. Paul says to the people, were you, were you baptized with the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we don't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. And so I would share with him the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why it was so important. I would show things within the scriptures. And it was something that we could talk about, but it was very theoretical. This was back in 2019. Well, here we are in 2022. And I received a phone call from this man months ago, earlier in the year. He calls me and he says, Nick, he says, you've been very involved with Christianity, with the Holy Spirit, this, that, and the other. But you've also been very involved on familiarizing yourself with Judaism, Jewish literature, Jewish perspectives, so on and so forth. And it's been three years now since we would continually talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I have a question for you now. I said, yeah. He said, now that you've really gone and seen both sides, he goes, what is your perspective today on the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And I said, the same it was in 2019. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. We are to walk in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. And every believer needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. And he says, I remember you kept telling me in 2019, I needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. And that until that happened, I was going to continue struggling with certain things. Because the Holy Spirit, it says, is going to break off sin. And it's going to help us to walk in power. And authority. Casting out devils. Healing the sick. So on and so forth. Prophecy. Speaking in tongues. All of these things that we find in the scripture. He says, I remember you kept telling me in 2019. And he goes, and I didn't understand it then. He goes, I want you to know that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He goes, it was the greatest feeling and the greatest experience that I have ever had with God, he said, I feel incredible. I feel amazing. I've never experienced that kind of love. All of the things that I was struggling with mentally, that stuff was just burned off, broken. It's powerless now. And we were just going back and forth on how important. And, and he still would ask me again, we would still talk about the necessity of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. In order for us to fulfill the ministry that we need to fulfill, in order to bring Messiah. This is what I'm afraid 
much of the body of the Messiah has fallen into is theoretical knowledge from a distance of the Holy Spirit, but not intimate power and revelation in our own lives. But this is something that the Father desires for each and every believer. Now, as I said, you've been hearing me talk quite a bit about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, not in detail, but at least mentioning it quite a bit in its importance in our lives today. And I've shared a couple stories about when we've laid hands on people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said last week how thankful I was that we've actually been getting people reaching out to us from all over that have been saying how they are hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and asking for more direction with this. Well, I am excited to say that here, with God's help, in the next couple weeks, I've already got the entire teaching basically laid out. I am going to be giving an extremely in-depth, in fact, the most in-depth teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I've ever given. How to prepare ourselves for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what the scriptures have to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, testimonies, personal and about others that I've personally watched and been involved with in regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What can hinder somebody from being baptized in the Holy Spirit? I'm going to be giving an extreme detail, beginning straight in the Torah, of what the Torah actually tells us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how we prepare ourselves, not just beginning in Acts chapter 2, but what does the Torah have to say about it? starting all the way back in the Torah, that is actually therefore taking place in the New Testament as well. Friends, it is time to get hungry. I hope that these, that these teachings and talking about these things gets us ignited with a fire for God. For it says that faith comes by hearing in Romans 10, 17, and hearing the word of God, hearing the testimonies. It was the testimonies that brought Jethro to the Lord in, in Exodus chapter 18. It says that Moses tells him all the things that the Lord did, and because of this, he became hungry and gave his life to the Lord. He renounced paganism and the worship of false gods and started worshiping the God of Israel. It is through the testimonies that people hear that actually cause others to have the flame rekindled in them. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we are going to be sanctified and walk in the image of the Messiah, as well as walking in power and fulfilling ministry that we are called to fulfill. Casting out devils, raising the dead, healing the sick, speaking with new tongues, walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the sake of gathering in the entire house of Israel.